Welcome to episode 162 of Ring Talk, the almost weekly Goodwin Boxing Show. We missed last week. Steve, you were away refreshing from the end of the tax year, the busy march at Goodwin Boxing. Are you nice and refreshed? All ready to go. Loads to do, loads of exciting things to do. So it's all all really good, really good. Back to normal. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and that starts, um, we're hoping this goes out on Friday, providing it does then the boxing restarts tonight. If you're watching this later on, then it wasn't tonight. Don't tune in. Um, Channel 5, you've got some interest, haven't you? Yeah, Kings League, Baniki. We we had um, we made a fight on our last Box Mania show with uh, Obieg Baniki, or Kings League Baniki, as he's labelled, against Jordan Dujon. Um, Wassermans were looking for a decent undercard fight, so we transferred it from our show to there. Better for... The boxer, the boxer's going to earn more money. So it made sense for us to sacrifice the promotional side to um, for the boxer's best interest. So it's now on a bigger platform. It's on tonight. Um, I see the bookmakers have got Jordan Dujon four to six favourite um, because he won the first bout between the two. I don't see it that way. Um, you know, I think you could call it a 50-50, but it definitely isn't. Um, it's definitely not 60-40 in Jordan's favour, that's for sure. That's how the book, book is priced it. I think um, Obi shaped really well against Lee Cutler. And um, I don't think Jordan's done anything that uh, Obi couldn't do just as well. So we'll see how it goes tonight. It's not a gimme fight, it's a hard fight. But I have us as a little a slight favourites in the, in, the, in the bout. Excellent. So good luck to Kingsley. Um see how he goes but uh, we'll, we'll update next week on how that's gone yeah lots of title fight news for goodwin boxing coming out this week in the board circulars i love sitting and having a read of the board circulars it's um sort of one of my nerdy things as a fan that i sort of i look forward to that date when they drop the british and the english every month yeah uh, and just reading through and i always find it quite fascinating seeing all the moving parts of the eliminators the new names that come in the ones that drop out and and sort of seeing how things are shaping up sort of over the next six to 12 months. They're pretty much a, a movable, movable feast. Um, so the main ones, we'll talk through some of the main ones that involve the Goodwin Boxing fighters on there. I know there's lots of bits that will shuffle and change out of all of this, but we'll go with what's been announced so far. Um, one that surprised me, and I'll come on to why it surprised me after you've spoken about it, but Lina Shadofia in an English title eliminator against Dan Catlin. It's a final eliminator. Um, we asked for Linus to be made mandatory. For the, I know Brad Pauls is the champion, but we were at the same time trying to get Brad Pauls a rematch with Nathan Heaney, which was a long shot, but it was we had to do our duty to ask that. I wasn't expecting it to be granted. Um, and the board have decided to um, give us a final eliminator against Dan Catlin for the English title. So, but we'll, we'll, we will do that fight if that's what's needed. Um, we think Linus wins it and um, it's a fight we'll do if that's what we have to do. We've got to get Linus back in the mix. The, the, the interesting thing about TV networks at the moment, and there's, there's a, there is a bigger change around this. They're not really signing fighters, long-term fight. They're looking to, to, to make fights. It's a totally different world. And if you do get a TV opportunity, you have to keep winning. Because if you don't win, you get cast to the side again. So Linus obviously lost to Kieran Conway in his last big TV fight, and he lost to Denzel Bentley prior to that. Yes, we know that Conway was just, was just an unfortunate eye closure. Yes, we know he was unlucky against Denzel Bentley. But it pushes him out of the down the pecking order and Brad's now obviously above Linus in the pecking order. So Linus has just got to get it. We've got to get him back in the pecking order so that he's right back up there again. And we, and if the board mandates something for us, we have to do it because, you know, he's not, doesn't want to be kicking about doing so. He's got to force his way back in and Linus is supremely talented. So he's got to force his way back in. And that's, that's what they've, um, that's what the board has decided to do. We didn't ask for that. But that, if that's what they want to do, um, we did think they might make Linus against Jordan Reynolds. We thought that was a strong possibility. Um, but they've obviously gone with Catlin because he's an area champion. So we think Linus is better than Catlin. So, of course, we're going to do the fight. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so a few things around it. So the Nathan Heaney thing in the British news, Hamza Shiraz has been uh, mandated for Nathan Heaney, which I can't see that happening, if I'm honest. Why would you why would you volunteer your title against Hamza Shiraz if you're Nathan Heaney? I think that's a hard night's work for anyone. Um, especially when they're talking about Nathan Heaney maybe taking a bit of a, a leap up to world level. Um and see how they get on. So I, I don't see that happening personally. I was just surprised with Linus that he'd been put in for the final eliminator for a title that he's previously possessed and owned. Um I do, I do find it surprising, okay, because I think he's beyond the final eliminator. Yes. He, he's a former champion, um, and he's only lost at, at a high level in very contentious, you know, the, 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 cut eye, the eye being closed was just a one-punch, unfortunate situation. Denzel Bentley lost for the British title in a split decision, and we're now talking about forcing him into a final eliminator. Yeah, for an English. There's... There's other things, other moving parts, which I'll talk to you off air about when we finish. Um, so, yeah, I think, but I will talk to you about that. But I'll talk to you, but I, it's not something I want to talk here. So I, I have a reading of the situation, and um, but it's not something that I can actually talk about on air at the moment. But yeah, so I think there's a little bit more to it than that. Yeah, so these are the kind of things that keep you interested in boxing, right? Because... I'm not going to second guess what those moving parts are, but when you've got someone who holds the English title, who's just bought for the British title, and then the British title is likely to become vacated in the not too distant future, I can start to piece together maybe what some of those moving parts are when you've got two uh, people involved in that, that scene. Um, so yeah, I'll chat to you off air about those. Um, Youssef Kamari has got his English title shot against Levi Kinsiona. Yeah. I mean, what had happened, and we were, just to go through the history of this, Yusuf had a final eliminator against Kirk Stevens. And the champion, Louis Sylvester, was fighting for the title a few weeks before. There is a ruling... He was fighting for the British, wasn't he? He was fighting for the British, yeah, sorry, yeah. But there is a ruling in the, in the board, which is very clear. And it says that, and it's a ruling that I always understood to be that's it, that's just a rule, that if you fought for in the same division that you hold a title against somebody who was eligible to fight for that title you hold and you lost, you immediately forfeit the title. So he was knocked out by Sam Noakes. We then all assumed, everybody involved, that we would get upgraded to the English title fight. The manager of Sylvester, Steffi Ball, contacted the board and the board made a decision not to enforce the, their own law. So, okay, so you're now stopping the kids fighting for the vacant title. We then move for Yusuf to be made mandatory for Sylvester, who wouldn't move aside to let this happen. And then Sylvester vacates. So you've really, in whatever the reasoning, and I know that Steffi will say they hadn't decided for sure and he wanted to talk to the box, so I understand all of that. But it was very clear that was going to happen to me. And in effect... You what said you, it on here. I said it, didn't I, before it happened. I said it. So in effect, what you've done is held up somebody's career, haven't you? We're going to come on to that later. <laughs> so, we then, so we then went on and we made a fight with Levi Kinsiona, who's managed by Kevin Merry. We made the fight quickly and asked the board to sanction this fight quickly because Yusuf had been held up, not for anybody's fault. But he should really now have already been English champion. Yeah, yeah. One thing I was thinking as you were saying that, how does Brad's title get affected by the draw with Nathan Heath? Doesn't. Now, the thing with Brad, what scuppered everybody in the English division, if he beats Nathan Heaney... He has to vacate. However, if he lost to Nathan Heaney, I would, of course, done cited case study of Louis Sylvester. You didn't strip Louis Sylvester. I don't want you to strip Brad Pauls, right? Even though yeah. it's a ball. I'd have, I obviously would have, as his manager, said, well, there's an example where you haven't enforced this rule. I don't want you to enforce that rule. But before the thing happened with Louis Sylvester, I assumed that if Brad won, he moves on from the English, and if he loses, he moves on from the English because he has to. Has it he drew? So he doesn't move on from the English, he still holds his <laughs> English champion. 
And that was how it is. Um, it is quite difficult in boxing because we all, and I'm talking about people in boxing, John Pegg, who's been in boxing longer than I have, um, other well-known names, all thought that wall was a wall. But it isn't. But well, we now know it isn't a wall, even though it is yeah. a wall. So it does mean that um, going forward, that isn't written in stone. So we, you know, whatever the reason is, it's not in stone anymore. So, which is fine because if that's the rules, if that's the rule that's not a rule, then it's fine for rules are only rules if they're applied, right? The... Yeah. 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 So it means that that's not really a rule, even though it is a rule. Um, so well, that's fine if you understand that's the case, and we move on. So because Brad Drew though. That didn't even come into it. He still remains as English champion. And that's where he is at the moment. He's now English champion. Now, we didn't have, we didn't evaluate that because at the time we are applying for the Nathan Heaney rematch. So we hadn't thought about the English title. Now we'll think about the English title. Yep. Yep. Um, and lots of options for Brad, I'm sure, out there. But, uh, so we've, had, we've had, we've had, Two offers this week already. Um, both were not suitable for various reasons, as you know. Um, I was going to make a comment, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've had two offers, so there will be there will be fights for Brad that make sense. And now we're just going to navigate him. He's his stock has risen dramatically, and um, yeah, as you know, the people the one of the fights is a, was a very very big name. And we would have happily done the fight if the terms had been right, but they weren't, so we didn't. It's not one you bank on. Um, right, moving on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Lewis Frimpong. Yes. First of June, up in Oldham. Yeah, Again. we had a, there was a purse bid. There was a purse bid for that fight. We we went big. We went big, and Kevin Murray beat us by three hundred quid. So we went big. It's frustrating, we, and. We had more in the locker. We could have gone higher. We could have gone higher. But we didn't. We thought we had a big enough bid to win it. And we didn't win it. That was the bid that we decided between myself, Andy Gill, the trainer, and Lewis. We went with the number, and we were 300 quid under. And we could have gone more. But that's the thing with purse bids. Kevin Merry big, bid big. We bid big. We could have bid bigger. But so be it. Now it means he's got to travel away. Makes a, It's a hard fight against Zach Miller. Um, Zach Miller's a good fighter. Um, without a doubt, I think that... Um, we're up against it up there, but I think Lewis Frimpong has got the style to give Zach Miller all sorts of trouble, and I'm confident we can we can win that title, even though it's away. Yeah, <clears throat> up in Oldham, which I'm sure will be a, uh, a very home friendly um, crowd for him. Doesn't, doesn't look like it's my only fighter travelling up to uh, the north of England for a title fight either, does it? No. No, um, nothing's been announced, has it, around... Well it, well, it has been announced by Kevin Merry on social media. The oh, OK. Callum Simpson's manager. So we haven't been told officially. No, it's, it was in the board notices, again, that Zach Chelly against Callum yeah. Simpson, but nothing official has come but out. But, but Kevin Merry's announced on social media that it's all happening in Barnsley, so I presume it probably is, but we haven't been told. Um, I've discussed this in quite a bit of detail on the George Groves Boxing Podcast, where what I said was, you see, Callum Simpson is from the Manchester region. Ben Shalom is from the Manchester region. So Ben Shalom has a affinity with Callum Simpson, a closeness. Um, and so, obviously, Ben Shalom, as you can see from his interviews, is even though he's, he's really getting behind Callum Simpson on this. It's all about Callum Simpson and not about Zach Shelley. Um, big gamble, big gamble for a promoter to make to really put yourself behind one fighter who at the moment, in my opinion, is a hype job. I, 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 know, I know people have been offended by me saying he's a hype job, but he's done nothing yet to warrant all this attention. Now, if he goes and beats Zach Shelley and beats Zach Shelley comfortably, you wouldn't say he's a hype job, you'd say he's a real deal because, but at the moment, he's just a hype machine. And you put your, you put, you, you do that to a fighter. Zach Shelley on the other side would, is quite able to see that Ben Shalom, and I'm not talking about all of Sky, but I'm talking about Ben Shalom, and he is the CEO of Boxer, is primarily just backing Callum Simpson to the hill for this fight. If Callum Simpson loses to Zach Shelley, 
then that, that leaves him in a bit of more of a difficult position because Zach Shelley will know what he that he's not played the level playing field with him. And Zach Shelley's stuck, stuck with Wise quite considerably by beating Callum Simpson in his hometown. So it doesn't sort of all go. It's not, in my opinion, the smartest way to play things. You should always, as a promoter, not show that bias because it, the result could go the way that you don't think it will go. I think they've got this wrong. I think Zach Shelley wins. And whilst I'm saying I understand the reason that they're doing it, I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think it's right that there's been a bias a bias shown by the CEO of Boxer. And I think that it would have been far better to put the fight on, as both boxers have got an allegiance with Sky. It's not home via way as such, although Ben would have, may well in some of his interviews show that that's the case. It would have been far better to have been in luck. You know, it's actually the champion, not the challenger, right? So in that position, I think the champion should be respected and therefore it should, this particular fight, should have been somewhere a bit more rather than having all the odds stacked against him. And so, whilst I understand what um, Box were doing, remember I haven't even been told for sure, but the other side seem to know it's happening. Um, if that's true, um, I don't necessarily agree with it, and no, no amount of thinking because I think that you should treat the champion with a bit more respect than just you know, than than him finding out that he's supposed to be going to Barnsley on social media. No, I agree entirely. Um, next one, <laughs> Goodwin versus Goodwin. Mikey Saki against Yasser El Gaina has been announced. Yeah, yeah that was. Um, that's uh, it's in, it, I say announced. It's in the board notices. Yes, it's it's uh, it's scheduled in for the eighth of June as we stand at the moment. Um, and that's um, we're going to be obviously discussing the situation with um, both boxers uh, in order to get it all resolved and sorted. Yeah, so it's a cracking fight on paper. Cracking fight. Yeah, eighth of June then. So that's a date that's been penciled in for that. Eighth um, of June is Box Mania. You've made the first official announcement on the eighth of June Box Mania today. Um, do you want to follow that up? Yep. So we've got. We can tell you that some of the people that we have already mentioned on here, or one of the what, big names, is going to be on Box Mania. But we'll announce that down the line. One of the biggest names, one of the highest profile we've mentioned, is going to be on Box Mania. Um, but the first title fight was announced, and we have got more to announce. By the way, there is another board notice, one you've missed, which I'll pick up on Albano Jr. Which I'll oh, yes, up. he's an eliminator, isn't he? And that's on the 8th of June, so let's start with that. Albano Jr. takes on um, a Kevin Merry fighter um, for a, an English title eliminator. Albano Jr. won a 10 round the last time against a Joe Underwood Hughes. They want to um, step it up again, and now he fights... Uh, Adam Sirkar, decent fight, that's a cracking fight in an eliminator for the English, although that's not been officially announced. That's on the board notices and it will be happening on the 8th of June. Um, and we've also got um, we've got um, Tim on Duglin defending his Southern Area Light Heavyweight title against Ross McGuigan, which will be a cracking fight. If anybody hasn't watched the knockout of um, Tim on Duglin last <laughs> time, it's always in an exciting fight. So that's going to be, and Ross McGuigan will come as well because it's his big night. It's going to be a cracking fight that. So we've got that as well on the on the fight. So the, those two fights are pretty much done. And we've got Yusuf Kamari scheduled, um, obviously, as we know, to fight Levi Kinsiona, and that could well be on the same day. But we haven't got that finally announced yet because Yusuf has got a slight cut that he suffered in his last fight Um against uh, when he fought uh, Kirk Stevens in his final eliminator. That's flared up this week. So we he might not make the 8th of June. We might get there, we might not. But it, it will be shortly after. But um, yeah, so the bottom line is Ross McGuigan is going to be challenging Tim on Duglin. Albano Jr. is going to be fighting Adam Serco in an English eliminator. So it's, um, and there's two other champions, really high profile champions that are also going to feature on the undercard so uh, at the moment so it's not only just the tile fights we've got we've got some big names on the undercard as well excellent excellent and yeah that ross mcguigan fight will be fun because ross comes to fight he won't he won't be shy in the ring um it'll be an interesting one uh, a couple of goodwin boxing signings this week so tyro masuro yep tyro masuro was was originally with mo prior and he had one fight under mo prior um, they decided to part company, and uh, Tyro came to to us. Now he's he's really exciting, man. You'd love him. He's um, an all action light heavyweight. He won about I think seven amateur titles. 
really, really talented. And he done off, he really puts on a show. He's probably going to be one of the most exciting small hall fighters around over the next few years. So delighted to have him. Excellent. And Tomo's going to be back out again um, in June, I think it is from memory. Um, so really looking forward to seeing him. And we signed the heavyweight, 5 and 0 heavyweight Tom Simmons um, over in Surrey there. And we're going to be building Tom. Tom's coming back out in May or June. And we're going to build him towards titles towards the end of the year. So I'm excited with him as well. So it's two really, really good signings. There's other signings we're in the um, process of um, doing at the moment, but they are the two that I can announce for now. But they're both already undefeated professionals <laughs> and have decided to come over to, to, to us to look after them. Brilliant. And it's always sort of, I know it's a bit sort of casual-ish, but whatever. There's always something fun about a heavyweight and what you can do with a heavyweight and... There's always that allure of a heavyweight. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what you do with Tom. Going back a couple of minutes what you're chatting about, you sort of mentioned Kevin Marie's name an awful lot during this episode. Um, how does it work as a boxer if you've got multiple sort of fights that you're engaging in with another manager like Kevin Marie? Do you start horse trading around how you're going to do things with them? No, you treat you treat it independently. I mean, he manages Callum Simpson. I manage Zach Shelley. That was that was ordered by the board. He manages Zach Miller. I manage Lewis Frumpong. That was sent out to purse bids. He manage, manages Levi Kinsiona. It was a fight a fight that we wanted, but it had to be in London. He knew he wasn't going to get that. For, you know, we were in pole position for that. So if he wanted the fight, he had to come to London. So he made that decision. Uh, Adam Sirkar, he's he wants to get a big fight for. They fancy their chances of beating Albano Jr. and prepared to travel for it. So we've done that one in London. So you just, you look at each individual fight and try and make some sort of, um, you don't sort of say, I'll do that for you, you do that for me. That's not how it works. You treat each right. individual, you treat individual fighters accordingly. And obviously Simpson and uh, Miller have got home advantage up there, obviously. Well, presuming that what we've been told is, is right. And obviously uh, down here, Obviously, Yusuf Kamari and Albano Jr. both had home advantage down here. So, no, I think Kevin's decent to deal with. He's going to take the fights that he thinks are right. I'm going to take the fights that I think are right. It's, it's fine. He's good. You know, good. You need to work with people that are going to be able to, you know, to work. Some some managers don't want, they want it all their own way if you do a deal with them. So, you just don't do deals with certain people. Um, we're working on something else at the moment with Errol Johnson at the, at the time of going on. So again, I've worked with John Pegg. I work with a lot of the other managers that, to try and fit in with, you know, fit in for what makes sense for all of us. Nice. Um, final thing in the world of boxing, really, this week. <laughs> Talking of managers and decisions that get made and how it all sort of gets played out in the end. What did you make of how Isaac Chamberlain versus Siobhan Clark played out? And for those that don't know, it was sort of um, issued by the board about a month back, about 29 days ago, something like that, 28 days ago. Um, and then, so it's Isaac Chamberlain as British cruiserweight champion to fight Siobhan Clark. Um, and then an hour before purse bids, Isaac Chamberlain's team apparently sort of rang up the board, vacated the British title and said, no, we're going to go and do the European against um, Sislak. Which is fine. I get that as a career move. You're vacating the British because there's an opportunity for the European. Um, it's not as appealing a fight to me, if I'm honest. Sort of, I don't care about Sislak. I do care about Siobhan Clark to some degree. Um, what sits uncomfortably, I'll sort of come on to some of it in a bit, but that one hour before purse bids, vacating the title, what do you make of it, Steve? It's not something I would do. Now, what do I make of it? You're, you're never going to get to the truth. You're never going to get to the truth. So Sky and Boxer will say, we don't, um, we do not have any influence on boxers withdrew in from purse bids, it is down to the manager. However, if you're a manager with a promotional contract, it is your promoter that will, will be saying whether they're going to put a purse bid in for something or not. And if the promoter says, I'm not going to bid for that, I don't want that fight. Well, you can't really go to purse bids because you haven't got any, any bullets mm -hmm. in your gun. 
So if a promoter wants to push it onto the manager and the manager will say, yes, it's my fault, I've made that decision, maybe true, maybe true. The, the look that's bad is it keeps happening with boxer fighters. And the problem with that is whether or not, however much influence Ben Shalom is having in this, it, and he may have none. I doubt very much he's got none, because I think a fight would always talk to their promoter. But it may not be him. But then it's going to be Adam Azim. Uh, and the McGuigans have done it last minute.com. Fraser Clark and 268 Management did it last minute.com. Seems to be that all their managers want to do it on the day of the purse bid. Quite coincidental, of course. And that's the way that it would look to the general public. Very coincidental. But officially, the promoter doesn't withdraw a fighter from the purse bid, the manager does. But if I have a fighter and I'm with Sky and we get a purse bid mandated against a Frank Warren, well, an Eddie Hearn fighter, and the promoter says to me, look, you're on a promotional deal here and you're due to be paid 100 grand. We don't want this fight. We're not going to bid for it. I'm going to have to withdraw him for the bid, aren't I? Because if I'm, I could be going down the road and fighting for nothing. Or I might not fancy, or I might not want the money that's coming from the other side, because Eddie Hearn may say I've offered life-changing money. Easy to say what life-changing money when nobody's seen the purse bid, isn't it? Anybody can make claims like that. And of course, <laughs> never believe everything you hear, because the purse bid may have been a low ball. It may have yep. been not very life-changing money. So if you don't, if your promoter's not backing you and you know you've got no guarantee, and you're going into a purse bid and you could be up, you could be fighting for nothing. You as a manager are going to go, well, if my promoter's not backing me. I'm going to pull him out the purse speed. Irrelevant to whether you want the fight or not. So I'm not saying, by the way, I'm not saying that's what's happened here. But I think as a promoter, whether it's Eddie, whether it's Frank, whether it's Ben Shalom, for a promoter to say, I have no influence in whether somebody pulls somebody out of a purse speed, it's nothing to do with us. I, I don't have, I can't accept that. Can't accept that. Whether or not this is McKenna's decision or not, I can't buy that because the promoter does have an influence. However, on the other hand, you've got to also build into the fact Mick Hennessy has some real long-term gripe with her over going back to Darren Barker and people like that and Carl Frotch when they were taken from him. And you never know whether this was a case of Mick Hennessy saying, I'm going to do this to you. You don't. And it could well have been. I don't know. Um, but I can't, you know, I, I think that the way that box have been, every time there has been a purse bid against Eddie Hearns, most of the time they have been shying away from it. Although I think there was a case where it was reversed when Carolyn Dubois was... Um, it was Rhiannon Dixon, wasn't it? Rhiannon Dixon. It was the other way around, and Eddie Hearn pulled Dixon off. But I don't think it was on the day. I think it was a bit before the day. So, of course, there is... Going back again, there is nothing wrong with pulling out of a purse bid. Nothing wrong. I don't, but it's going back to the situation of what I experienced with Yusuf Kamara. If you are making a decision which fucks up a boxer's career or delays their career, then that's wrong. That's wrong. If you know what you're going to do anyway, and that is my issue. Whoever is responsible, they should hold their head in shame for, for messing up people's careers and messing up the people in bodies. Boxing's a hard life for boxers, and they shouldn't be doing this to them. So that's my total view. But you're never going to find out the truth of who did what because it will never come out. Yep. <clears throat> yep. And it's that thing of boxers and people in boxing will always say it's a hard sport to be involved in and it's a short career, right? Those two things are fundamentally true. So why make it hard for some, why make it harder for somebody else, in this case, Siobhan Clark? And given it is a short career, why waste 27 days of that career, which is a month, and you've only got maybe, what, I don't know, 10 years top? Siobhan Clark's an older guy. He's not going to do 10 years in boxing. So that is a reasonable percentage of his career. He's probably got, he's probably got three to four years to get his move on. You're talking about they've taken 3% of his career away from him. Yeah, for, for what? I mean, just to, to play around with it? I don't know. And I know, I know, right? The argument against that is, well, it's a, a deadline and you stick to that deadline. And if the board have given that deadline, they've got every right to use up to the last hour of it and then make their decision. Okay, but don't... 
and this is what really gets me about it. I'm not blaming Isaac about it because I don't believe Isaac's ducking Siobhan Clark for a second. Isaac will fight anyone. Anyone. Um, but Isaac has been fucked around throughout his career in numerous ways. We can go back to the days that he signed for PBC, apparently. The sort of difficulties around the Akoli fight. His career has been stalled at so many different places You'd think him of everyone would sort of appreciate the difficulties that boxers go through and therefore maybe try and discourage causing those same difficulties for somebody else. That's what disappoints me a little bit about it. Um, I know it's not Isaac's decision to do it, but it's the people that Isaac's employing that are making the decisions to do it. And that's what sort of gripes with me a little bit. And, um, I'm, you know, I've seen it on Twitter. I've literally seen it on Twitter. Some people going, ah, well, screw her and blah, blah, blah. It's a, you know, I'm glad to see Hearn sort of getting buggered over with it. Like, it's not Hearn, though, is it? Because out of the back of this, Siobhan Clark is fighting for the British title against um, the Warren fighter. I can't remember who it is. Ellis Sorrow. That's it, yeah. Um, so thankfully, Clark sort of can move on relatively quickly and it falls in line with that board um, sort of next sitting and because if not, it could have been almost a two-month delay to find out what was going to happen with him. I just find it all poor, frankly. And you'd like to think people in boxing want to see other people do it. And I know it's every man for himself. I know it's doggy dog. I know there's board deadlines. And maybe there's an argument to make those board deadlines slightly shorter. Why do you need that much time? Um, but if genuinely, as per Mick Hennessy's sort of release, if genuinely... They were just using all that time to make a decision. They came to a decision that morning. I would question your decision-making process because, like, Mick Hennessy hasn't got a lot of other fighters that he's making decisions for, so why is it taken up to the, the very last second to do so? It doesn't, does it? Because at that point, you would, doesn't. you'd have meetings to decide what your bid's going to be. What you Listen, if I got a purse bid given for a boxer, I could make a bid within a week. Give it a week. You don't yeah. need more than a week to finalise what you're going to do. You don't. So you yeah. could have a first bid deadline of a week, you could do it. Yeah, I think that's maybe as much the, the sort of gripe and the issue is why make it four weeks? Why not just make it two weeks? Um, and then you sort of yeah. negate these potential delays. But ultimately, yeah, I, the, the whole thing was uncomfortable for me. I'm not pro or anti any promoters particularly or managers or anything. I just... I'd like to see people get the opportunities and not get screwed around because there's enough screwing around in boxing already. Why why play about with somebody else's career? Why sort of play God with it? It doesn't it doesn't sit well with me. Um and I let Mick know on Twitter this week. And, uh, yeah, so <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be blocked. You'll be blocked. No, I'm surprised I'm not already. Um yeah. So no, I say I'm you know, I sort of have a reputation of being anti Hearn. I'm not anti Hearn. I'm very pro Hearn in this one. I think he's, you know, it's poor behaviour against Siobhan Clark, who is a Hearn fighter. Um, and that's what it comes down to. It's the boxer. Remember, it's not whoever, exactly the boxer. It's the boxer that gets screwed over by this. It's the boxer that Yusuf Kamari may have a delay of his career now by four months, five months. He's 28, right? He's probably got, say, five years, right? You've just taken 5% of his career away from him. Yeah, and I think that that's what gets me, is that <laughs> it is a short career. Boxer are the first to say it. Boxer are the first to say it's difficult. So why screw someone else up? I know it's dog eat dog, but maybe just be better. Be better people. Yeah, no, exactly. Anyway, anyway on that positive note... <laughs> Uh, we'll be back next week and we'll start going yep. into what's upcoming for Goodwin Boxing as well and let people know. But in the meantime, keep June the 8th free in your diaries. Get down we'll, do, to your... we'll do a Q&A next week as well. All right, let's do a Q&A next week. Yeah, people can give us some uh, some thoughts, some grief. Give us the hard questions. I like them. I'm giving them to Steve. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's get on to that. All right, mate. Brilliant. Brill. All right. Cheers, Steve. Take care, my friend. Speak Take to you soon. Bye-bye.